And our guest this hour is the Honorable Justice Professor Joel Ngoge. He is the judge of the High Court and presiding judge of the Nakuru High Court. He is also the chairman of the National Steering Committee for the Implementation of the Alternative Justice Systems Policy. <sighs> I'm done. <laughs> chairman. <laughs> <I'm going now. laughs> Your work is done for the day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Goodness. It's good to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Now, you know, City will ask that question. Yes. How should we refer you? How should we call you? Your Honor, uh, Honorable Judge, Professor. Justice. Justice. Justice Professor. <laughs> and you forgot Baba Kioni. Oh. Ah! Sylvia's yeah. husband. Wow. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, oh. <laughs> All those are mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Toto <Mama> Lucy. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> good ones yes <laughs> good ones prof you recently moved now to the nakuru station yes. how are you finding nakuru uh nakuru is great it's not that reason actually it's already three years mm -hmm. uh since i moved to nakuru to nakuru, uh, yes. nakuru uh nakuru is an up-and-coming city uh, it has everything that you ask of a city yet uh everything you also ask of a more laid-back uh, rural place so i mm. i'm really loving it in nakuru Great. And it's not too far from Nairobi, so mm -hmm. you can still spend your weekends in Nairobi. Um, I'm hoping the Chief Justice is not listening to this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, might, I, that might provoke her to move to me further. further. She might be thinking I might be having too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Move you further from here and take you, you yes. know. So recently, the uh, Chief Justice rolled out these plans. But even before that, it was a whole conversation about alternative justice systems that are taking place. You chaired the task force that led to the birth of this policy. Correct. So tell us about alternative justice systems. What's that all about? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, let me start by saying, um, uh, um, I think in this country, what we're trying to do now is to change conversations about justice. Uh, for a very long time, um, I would say since the advent of uh, colonialism, we've uh, pursued justice in this disputational mode this adversarial mode uh, which we were taught uh, and which uh, we then uh, sort of became very good at and uh, it superimposed our systems, our organic systems, which still exist. Uh, but uh, when we talk about justice today, we still think of justice in that adversarial disputational mode. Mm -hmm. And we think that is a very unnatural way a uh, very inorganic way mm. to think about justice and we think a lot of the problems that we see in the justice system are caused by this way of uh, of thinking um, about justice. So um, uh, the aim here is to try and bring back our organic plural systems of justice that have existed since time immemorial that are more natural uh, to, to our people uh, and um, I believe that lead to better justice. Mm. Uh, we say to Kenyans, um, when you think about health, uh, your health, you don't necessarily think about hospital. Mm. In fact, you think about hospital when you are unhealthy. Yep. But when we think about justice in Kenya, we think about the court. Yes. It should be the other way around. And jail. Uh, yes, and jail. Mm. And that's not justice. I, I think we need to be thinking about justice in the same way that we think about health. We don't go to the hospital to get health. We get our health in our own homes, in our own communities, in what we eat, in what we do every day. Mm -hmm. And that has to be about justice. So justice has to be palliative. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what alternative justice systems is. And that's what we want to take back most of the cases, mm -hmm. most of our conversations about justice. And I believe we'll have a much better society mm -hmm. uh, if we go there. Do I almost hear you saying, Prof, then that you need to include community in this justice seeking or... or justice making uh, because that would mean when you're looking at health then you're looking at the things that you eat every day you're looking at uh, the exercise you do every day so if you're looking at justice the communities that you interact with on a daily basis to make sure that things are you know at least at a rumble level is that what you're saying Ab bringing traditional communities absolutely to absolutely that's what we're saying and um and luckily for us it's not just us saying uh constitution of kenya 20. 10 in its genius said it already mm. um so in article 159 actually starting with article 2 even in uh, delegating judicial power to the judiciary it's very clear that the people remain sovereign mm. even uh in the justice sector and mm. then in article 159 it still comes back and tells us that we must promote 
alternative justice systems as uh, perhaps the most superior way of resolving some kinds of disputes, perhaps most kinds of disputes. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, it's a question of going back to the communities, uh, promoting their own systems of justice, promoting their own conversations about justice. Mm -hmm. um, that's what this is all about. But then communities are different. Yes. That means that one community's approach and conversations around justice may not be necessarily the same in another community. So does it mean that, that also looking at each community handling its justice its own way, or should there be a common thread? Ah, getting right to the, uh, to the uh, depth of it, uh, Eric. Um, yes. Um, so two things. Uh, so first of all, um, in Kenya today, when we, talk, when we talk about alternative justice systems, we are not necessarily talking about um, my grandfather's, your grandmother's African customary law, necessarily. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that we realize is that, one, um, a lot of the justice that is practiced every day, the quotidian justice in the community, mm -hmm. uh, even in communities that we might think are... are uh, you know, uh, people of the same community live. So if you go to um, deep in um, uh, Il Kapute in Maasai and you think there are only Maasai people there, you will find that a lot of the time uh, when they are speaking, they're having conversations about justice today, you will find that it's infused with a lot of ideas uh, about human rights, a lot of ideas about that's already in statute law, a lot of ideas borrowed from the Kambas uh, and so forth. So that customary law has really grown. So when we talk about alternative justice system today, we're not necessarily talking about it in its anthropological sense. We are saying about systems of justice that are organic, mm -hmm. that reside in the communities. Sometimes they use some uh, uh, African customary law that has already been infused with um, uh, modern notions of law or human rights or constitutional norms and so forth. And sometimes um, they just use common sense. Sometimes mm. they just use logic um, uh, and, uh, uh, and so forth. So um, the notion of alternative justice systems that we are deploying now, um, and as it's comprehended in the uh, uh, judiciary policy on alternative justice systems, basically comprehends all those forms of alternative justice system. Mm. Uh, if a certain group of people prefer to have uh, their own AJS mechanism that binds them because of their anthropological lineage, mm. so be it. The constitution allows it. But if they also come together because they live in a neighborhood mm -hmm. and they decide that we're going to be resolving our disputes this way in this neighborhood, that's also allowed. If they decide they're going to be resolving their disputes in a particular way because they belong to a particular church, that's also allowed. And the Constitution in Article 159 tells us promote mm -hmm. all those forms. The only um, proviso yes. that the Constitution gives us is that all those alternative justice systems, both in their processes and in their outcomes, must be undergirded by constitutional values in the first place. And in the second place, they cannot, um, uh, uh, they cannot uh, violate uh, the Bill of Rights. So the Bill of Rights is supreme. Okay. And it is the basic minimum that you are asking. That's the basic minimum, both in terms of substance, but also in terms of process. If it meets those standards, then we as a judiciary, we have an obligation to promote those justice systems and enforce any awards that they come up with. And if it doesn't? If it doesn't, then um, that's why the role of the judiciary in Article 159 is to promote. So yeah. promote is human rights lingua. Mm. Um, it means at least three things. It means, number one, you respect mm where they promote the norms of the constitution and the values of the constitution. Mm -hmm. But it also means that you, um, you protect. So you protect the victims where they do not. Okay. So where they do not comply with the constitutional values, mm -hmm. then that's where the judiciary in its interaction with those forms uh, of alternative justice systems can say, the outcome here does not comport with the values of the constitution. So it will not be enforced. What role does the judiciary play <clears throat> in the structure of the structuring of the individuals who will play this particular role in the communities? Okay. The, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Muga. So this, is, this was almost rehearsed because I talked about human rights language and I was unbundling what promoting means. And I talked mm. about respecting. Yeah. I talked about protecting. And your question takes me to the third aspect of promoting, and that is transforming. Mm. 
So one of the roles of the judiciary is also to transform those alternative justice systems. So it's not just to accept them as they are, but to infuse the human rights, uh, 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 human rights uh, 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 language, human rights norms, the expanding um, uh, uh, norms of human rights and the expanding corpus of human rights um, uh, 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 worldwide, globally, are supposed to be infused in these alternative justice systems in the interactions that the judiciary has in them. So the role of the judiciary as we see it and as, we, as, as, uh, as we've interpreted it uh, means, one, to come up with a policy that guides these alternative justice systems. That's why we have the alternative justice systems um, uh, uh, policy. It provides some basic guidelines on some of the uh, uh, the basic minimums that they should meet. But also, um, uh, the policy provides for an approach, um, a, a pedagogical approach that is really didactic uh, of engagement with these mechanisms so that in the engagement, there is cross-learning. There's a lot that we can learn from these alternative justice systems in uh, in our formal court systems. Mm. So we learn from them, even as we teach them some of the uh, basic minimums that we know from the Constitution. So that in that cross-learning, we transform each other. We transform their systems as they, transfo as they transform us. Because nobody mm. said that we are the, we are the gurus mm. of, of, of justice. Let me expand on this. Huh? Yes. The alternate justice system yes. that one considers, well, I consider, and I know it's structured, say the arbitration, mediation. However, yes, for yes. the longest time in community settings, yes. the chiefs, yes. the elders, these were the pillars of this particular system. Yes. Now, why I asked about the judicial uh, participation in this is, is there not a need for some of these individuals to be trained, yes. to get additional training so that they are grounded yes. in some of these things which are nuanced in the constitution, stated and understood by those who are in the judiciary, so that the issue of a diversion from what the constitution seeks to pursue and entrench is minimized. Yes, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. The word you use is train. Um, in Paul Frere's uh, 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 tradition, I do not necessarily call it training because I see that as very um, sort of top-down. I see it as engagement. That's what I call didactic engagement. Mm. It's, 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 uh, so I'm borrowing from the pedagogy of the oppressed. I mean, so <laughs> this is bottom up, right? <laughs> um, so what we, uh, uh, we, 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 we don't necessarily say that we go and train. We go and say we engage mm. with them. We engage with them so that in the engagement, they get to learn as we get to learn. There is a lot that they'll teach us even as we teach them about the constitutional values. So, mm -hmm. so it is about the engagement. And yes, the policy is all about engagement. Mm -hmm. It's about um, uh, engaging with them, getting to know uh, what is it that they do, what are the social, uh, societal problems that they're dealing with, how are they transforming them into, into legal problems, and then how are they resolving those legal problems, and then uh, perhaps suggesting mm. uh, some of the creative solutions that come, come out of the... Uh, of the constitution. Mm. And through this engagement, uh, Muga, we've already been able to uh, make a lot of headways in a lot of, uh, a lot of places. So um, if you go to, uh, we, we, we just launched the AJS model in Kajado, and you, um, uh, you might imagine, for example, uh, the Maasai would be a very patriarchal society. They would be very um, uh, uh, opposed mm. to the idea of having uh, female elders mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. Mm. Uh, and you would be surprised that uh, one of the things that they were very, very open to is the idea that, yes, uh, females can be elders. Mm -hmm. Yes, the youth can be elders mm -hmm. and so forth. So if you watched... Um, Actually, Judge, yes, let's, let's just do this. Yes. Give us that example yes. of the one that you launched in Kajedo. Yes. So what is it? For people who just... Okay, so we're hearing alternative justice system. What is it that you launch in Kajero? Is it a court? Is it a council of elders? What, what is it? Very good. Um, thank you. Uh, what we launched in Kajero was a model of an AJS system that is homegrown in Kajero. Hmm. It is um, uh, it's spearheaded by five agencies, but um, uh, the, I would say the other of the model is the county government. So the county government of Kajiado is worried about economic development in Kajiado. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, hampers economic development uh, is uh, uh, in Kajiado is the land disputes. 
that uh, uh, affect Kajiado because mm. of its its uh, proximity. Uh, proximity to um, Nairobi metropolis, but also because of the historical uh, immigration into Kajiado. I'm from Kajiado County myself, mm. born and bred. Uh, my parents went to Kajiado back in the uh, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of immigrants in in um, uh, in Kajiado who have bought land uh, from the Maasai people who traditionally have been pastoralists. A lot of the immigrants uh, uh, practice sedentary agriculture and so forth. So there there have been disputes which have hampered mm -hmm. economic development. So the county government uh, realized that if we're going to move social development to the next uh, next level in this uh, in this county mm. we need to resolve these disputes and courts are not the way to go because mm -hmm. you will bog down the courts these things will remain there forever and even when those issues go to court sometimes they'll go to court and the court will come up with with its judgments and rulings and mm -hmm. so forth but enforcing them socially becomes very problematic right huh? so they decided i think the way to do this is why don't we revivify traditional ways of resolving these disputes. Mm -hmm. And when they say traditional, they don't even mean Maasai. They just mean African. Right. Uh -huh. There is something that's so common about how Africans talk about justice and talk with each other or have uh, conversations about justice with each other. So what they decided to do was to uh, go the traditional route of saying uh, in Kajiado there, were, there are 11 sub-tribes of the Maasai. They are called sections. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you knew, but the Maasai actually have sub-tribes. They're called mm -hmm. Iloshon in, in, um, among the Maasai. And so they decided they'll have nine sections for each of the Maasai sections um, to resolve some of those disputes that come within those sections. Uh -huh. And then they will have one cosmopolitan one, which is mainly found in, Go um, in Gong, uh, where it's, comp it's very, very cosmopolitan. And a lot of the land disputes that will be emanating in those places will be resolved by the elders. So they carried out um, uh, uh, an exercise of recruiting elders, panels of elders in each of these 10 sections. Mm. Uh, this exercise, we supported the exercise with, uh, uh, with technical expertise, but it's supported by the Food and Agriculture Organization, which of course is interested in the question of, of uh, food security, which is also hampered by the disputes to land. Mm. It is also supported by the National Land Commission, which has a constitutional mandate to resolve land conflicts before yeah. they come to court. Mm. And then of course the judiciary, which is interested in not having these cases come and bog us in, uh, in court. So what we were launching in Kajiado um, on Friday was these homegrown, autochthonous uh, dispute resolution mechanisms uh, where they will resolve their own disputes. And where the court comes in, the, uh, the court has come in in Kajiado through the Court Users Committee, mm. where the court is basically pledging, if you go and resolve your disputes there, we will respect the outcomes of those disputes. When they come to court, we will not really to get them. Mm. We will just check for procedural propriety to make sure that the constitutional norms of procedure have been, have, um, uh, have been met. Uh -huh. We will also check for um, uh, what we call proportionality. Proportionality analysis is just to say, have the substantive norms of the constitution been adhered to? Okay. And if those two are checked, then we will just enforce the award as it is. We need to get. Okay. okay, let's take a break. Yes. And then we come back and you give us a little bit more about this. We have in studio with us the Honorable Justice Professor Joel Ngoge, uh, Judge of the High Court of Kenya, presiding judge of the High Court in Nakuru, and also the chairman of the National Steering Committee for the Implementation of the Alternative Justice Systems Policy. Now I can say, now because I understand what we're talking about, right? We are live on KTN Home, on Spice FM and online, The Situation Room on Spice FM, online and on KTN Home. In the room this and every week the morning is Nduoko C.T. Muga and Eric Latif. Joining us today this hour is the Honorable Justice Professor Joel Ngoge, Judge of the High Court and also Chairman of the National Steering Committee for Implementation of the Alternative Justice Systems Policy. Mm -hmm. As we're going to the break, Judge, you're explaining to us what, for example, was launched in Kajiado, which is to be replicated around the country. Maybe you can explain to people, is it uh, this system going to be dealing with both civil and criminal cases, or is there some distinction between there are things that cannot be handled here and others that can? Or um, because we've had many complaints of Mm. And assuming that that is what the alternative justice system is, and in many cases, for example, in Sexual Offences Act, uh, complains that people went to talk Kinyumbani and the victim is a child. 
So okay. how how does this work? Okay. Uh, two very uh, good questions which I want to just take some time to respond to because they are very crucial. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, what was launched in Kajado is not really what will be replicated uh, throughout the country. What was launched was the model mm. that Kajado has chosen, Kajado County, and has chosen it because of its unique circumstances and the where the justice conversations in that county has taken them. And the main issue there is land. Mm. That is the main issue. Other counties and other places might choose different ways of addressing uh, what their most important justice conversation is. Okay. For example, uh, in the pilot stage when we were doing the, uh, when we were the task force, when we were writing this uh, policy, one of the places we visited was Othaya. And Othaya has a very interesting homegrown AJS system as well, which uh, we studied as a pilot. And there the main issue was not land, the main issue was Mongiki, actually. It was just these um, youthful gangs and mm. so forth. But they were showing themselves, in, they were registering in the, criminal, uh, in the justice system as criminal cases. Mm. Um, you know, drunk and disorderly, uh, preparation to commit felony, you know, uh, burglary, just uh, fighting and so forth. But uh, the people in Othaya realized that they are sending most of their young people to prison. Mm. And there was a bigger conversation to be had, rather, which could not be laundered using the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. So they used the alternative justice system as the way to have that conversation. And Otha is one of the places where they almost completely eliminated uh, the, pro the Mungiki problem. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were no extrajudicial killings. There were no killings. There, were no, there was no mob justice. They talked it out mm -hmm. uh, using uh, the court, uh, court users committee as uh, using its convening power. So that was the main, main problem there. Okay. Uh, Kajado has a different problem. So different places will come up with different models for resolving their disputes. All the judiciary promises in this policy is whatever homegrown uh, system you come up with, whichever uh, uh, kinds of disputes you decide would be cured or will be solved or will be resolved in those, uh, in, uh, in those mechanisms, mm. we will promote we will respect, we will protect, and we will help you transform. That is what the policy says. Okay? So now we come to the question, um, um, are there some kinds of disputes or controversies that are off limit yeah. that will just not be uh, handled there? Mm. The answer is yes. Um, but that answer is not answered uh, categorically with a bright line rule. It is answered with a principle. Mm -hmm. The principle that is applied to determine if a case uh, will be resolved, can be resolved uh, fruitfully in an AJS system or not, does not depend on whether the case is criminal or civil, constitutional or statutory. What it depends on is the application of what we call the agency principle. Mm -hmm. The agency principle asks the question, can you ask of the two disputants who are approaching the mechanism, mm. can you say that they each credibly, voluntarily, and in the exercise of their own agency, chose to be in that forum? That's the first question. That's a positive test. Okay. If you can say that in the exercise of their agency and human autonomy, they credibly and voluntarily chose the AJS system, then you have an obligation, a constitutional obligation to let them proceed in their case in that forum. And this is all parties? All parties. Okay. Then secondly, mm -hmm. you have to ask the question, is there any statutory or constitutional criteria that outs the jurisdiction of the AJS mechanism? Mm -hmm. That's a negative test. If, they, if, they, if there's a statute that says that case cannot be heard in that forum, then mm -hmm. the inquiry ends. Okay. But in the, going back to the first one, which is the more complicated one, um, it's an objective test. It's not a subjective one. So if, um, uh, if you come, for example, this is why the uh, cases involving children, for example, mm -hmm. will never be had in the AJS mechanism mm. through the application of the AJS principle. Because there's no way you'll be able to say that through the application of the agency principle, that party credibly exercised their agency and they chose that forum. Mm. Most cases involving violence against women will also, most times, not 
be applicable in the AJS system because mm -hmm. if a woman has already been um, uh, has, 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 has been assaulted or mm -hmm. has undergone violence in a system that m might be uh, patriarchal, um, uh, uh, then you have to do an objective analysis and say, can we really say that this woman has credibly chosen? to be in that um, uh, uh, in, in, in that mechanism. Mm. So through the application of the, uh, of the agency principle, then we are able to really see mm. which are those cases which then can, can and should be in that system and which ones should not be in that system. It's a really, it's a really simple um, uh, 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 mechanism. Of course, hard, uh, complicated in some few cases, yeah. but you know, we say in law that hard cases make uh, make bad law. Right. So we are making <laughs> cases for the majority of cases. Okay. Okay. Yes. So I'm looking at a system whereby uh, the police yes. um, as, a, as a service yes. play yes. in the expansion of justice, yes. right? So as it is currently uh, constituted, yes. uh, there's a system whereby if a crime has been committed, most likely it has been reported to the police, police then take it on before it finds its way, uh, you know, essentially, eventually at the courts, right? Yes, yes. Now, looking at AJS, yes. what role, if any, yes. would they play yes. knowing very well yes. that they must go through the courts? Yes. As, as a service, yes. they have to go through the courts, yes. constituted to do so. Okay. Will they play a role in AJS as well? Yes. Very good question. And do you would have made a very good student. Um, <laughs> so, I, so I would say this. Um, so uh, the, first of all, if a matter is reported to the police station as a crime, hmm. as an incident, uh, there is no requirement that it must end in court. There's no legal requirement okay. that it must end in court. In fact, uh, the police and the prosecutor are one of our foremost targets in the pedagogical engagement I was talking to Muga about mm -hmm. right. because they make a lot of decisions that have a lot of impact on the justice system. Um, in our own study, we found that, in fact, it's in the police stations where most, no, let me not say most, let me say a lot of AJS takes place. Mm -hmm. uh, someone reports to court and we found it's um, um, in many cases where people report a matter to court, but not because they want to the matter to end up as a criminal case. Mm. They report because they want to open avenues of conversation. Mm. So they want to use the police as a convening power, as a convening authority mm. to call the other person and say, why are you doing this? Why did you encroach into my, my dispute? Why is my son coming home and uh, drunk and threatening to beat me and I'm the father yeah. and so forth. They don't want that son to go to prison. Mm. Okay. If you're a policeman and you're not well trained, you would think, okay, I'm just going to write up a charge sheet. I will take to the prosecutor and the prosecutor again, if they're not well trained, they will think I'll just sign the, this and I will take it to court. And then when they come to court, you find the father really pleading. The same complainant is the same father who <laughs> wants to put bail for yeah. the son. And they're yeah. saying you're sending my son to, to, custody and that's not what i intended i just mm. intended us to have a conversation so we are going to be training a uh, policeman we're going to be training chiefs we're going to be training prosecutors and so forth um on really the essence and the essentials of alternative justice systems and really what our criminal justice system should be doing our criminal justice system should not be put in in motion just because something that is cognizable as a crime mm. has been committed it is not always the case that it should be. That is why, if you look even at the prosecutor's uh, policy, one of the things they, they, they have to use two, two tests to determine whether to charge or not. Mm -hmm. It is not just that a crime has been committed. The first question they ask is, first of all, there's evidentiary standard. Do we have the evidence? Mm -hmm. But the second one is public interest standard. Is it in the public interest for me to use public resources to, to charge this person and prosecute them? Or are there other mechanisms that can be used mm -hmm. to deal with this problem? You know, from where I sit, huh, yes. the judicial system is introducing a brave new world. A good one. Mm -hmm. But there's a concern. Yes. You mentioned in passing, but I'd like to dwell on it a little more. Ensuring that whatever judgment, whatever decision is arrived at, is actually implemented whether it is at whatever level. Yes. Because one of the problems that we read about yes. 
even with court rulings. Yes. Enforcement. That's it. Yes. Judgment we hear. Lovely. Thereafter. Yes. The thing that I find painful, yes. most painful, is when people are given compensation through a judgment yes. of court. Yes. Years later, it is still a story. Or cases of land, mm. land disputes. Yes. Like say the issue of the Solia Ranch. Mm -hmm. Man, 48 years going, things still in court and you're wondering, people have died. People mm. who started this thing have died. Yes. Understand? So, so that we don't go to this history that I'm referring to. Yes. What is the judicial system going to do? Okay. Uh, so, Muga, I think you've made one of the most passionate arguments for alternative justice systems. Yes, uh, because what you have <laughs> done here is to say, um, so if you look at our justice need survey, which was done, which was commissioned by the judiciary, it says that a, um, six, uh, 79 percent of all disputes uh, that Kenyans had in the last four years, 79 percent, they didn't bring them to court. 79 percent. They took them somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me start uh, a step uh, step before. So you've had people saying that Kenyans are very litigious people. Yes, right. I've heard it. So we have empirical proof for it. Uh, the empirical proof is in the Justice Needs Survey, which says that. Um, so in the last four years, a uh, eighty-one percent of Kenyans who felt aggrieved by a decision or an action of another person mm -hmm. decided to take action. Mm -hmm. Eighty-one percent. That's an extremely high number. Mm. Okay, if you do Tanzania, it will be about fifty percent. Okay, while we in Kenya, eighty-one percent decided they are going to do something yes. about it. Okay, so that's why we actually say Kenya is litigious. But but most of them did not actually come to court. Seventy-nine percent, again, this is empirical, mm. decided to go somewhere else. They decided to go to. Was there, they decided to go to their pastor, they decided to go to the police, but he didn't end up in court. They decided to go to the chief, they decided to go to their uh, uh, estate association, their clan association, whatever. They decided to go somewhere else. Only 21% ended up in court. Did you even go to which doctors? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so only 21% end up in court. Mm. The problem of enforcement of judicial decisions that we are talking about are this part of the 21%. And we're already tired about talking about it. It's already exhausting. We're already seeing how much it's eroding the confidence of the public in the court. And that's only the 21%. The research shows that 96% of all decisions that are made outside court in the alternative justice systems are feared to, mm. without the need for any outside enforcement. Mm. 96%. So 96% of the 79% who went to other alternative justice uh, systems did not need me to sign an order saying that you must do this. 96% mm. of them did not need to involve a police with a gun to go and enforce that order. Mm. They didn't need anyone to go to jail to enforce that order. Mm. They just did it. It is self-executing. Mm. So if we're going to really have an optimal use of our scarce resources that are being directed to the, um, uh, to the justice sector, then this is really the way to go. Then we can really focus on the 21%, which by the way is already too much for the judiciary. Mm. If you look at the 21%, last year we're talking about a total of 484,000 cases filed in court. 484,000 cases uh, uh, translates to about 800 cases per year per judicial officer in Kenya today. It's impossible for a judicial officer to, mm. uh, to complete these 800 cases anyway. Uh, even in a year. So the backlog is likely to continue rising unless we do something about it. Mm. And so we need to reduce the number of cases through these conversations that is palliative. Mm -hmm. This this conversation that um, uh, diverts cases to really that fits the first to the forum, to the correct forum, mm. so that the few cases that then end up in court, we can spend the appropriate amount of time mm -hmm. dealing with them. And then we can pursue those who disobey court orders with singular vehemence. Right. <laughs> yes. So before you go to that, which I know Eric yes. wants to jump on yes. in terms of those who disobey court orders, the yes. very quick one, you talked about limited resources. Yes. And so obviously it's a thing. Yes. So now if we're looking at AJS going to traditional community leaders and elders and such, will there be compensation for them? Because that means now, you know, some of the time is going to be taking up, taken up in 
sorting out this? Will there be compensation for them? And then who's to ensure that uh, they will do this in record time and make sure that these cases are dealt with so that we don't go back into the same rut right. that you've talked about of time being sapped? Right. Uh, so two things. So first of all, um, the, the approach we've taken now is that if, if something is not broken, mm. don't fix it. Mm. Okay, so 79% of these cases are already being heard okay. and determined mm. effectively in the AJS system. Okay, why would we want to fix that? Mm. It's not broken, it's working. F fixing that means we start going and, th and then telling them, hey, you know, you've been deciding these cases now. <laughs> what do you think about us paying you yeah. for right. resolving them? Yeah. We don't have the money to pay them. They're already <laughs> doing it. They're doing it as a sort of sense of responsibility. So people on. do this all the time. Mm -hmm. So we're just encouraging people to do it. And what we want to give them is, a, is that civic sense of pride mm. in doing what they do mm. that they know that they are participants in the justice uh, in the in the in the justice sector and that what they are doing matters i think that is more than they want mm. and when we've talked with them uh, everywhere in the country where we've gone they're quite happy to continue doing it they need um, some of them ask for very basic uh, facilitation mm. they need places to buy, they need uh, money to buy just a book where they yeah, record the cases that they've had and, right. and pens and, and, and so forth. And some of them um, are in the structured uh, mechanisms like in Kajado, they would need a, a, a fair, mm. bus yeah. fair to go to the venue. Sure. Uh, where and, 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 and so those, those are being organized in, 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 in different settings and so forth. But the judiciary is not, it's not, it's not saying we have this ton of money mm. which is available mm. to give to the alternative justice systems. We are saying, please come up with your own justice systems that work, uh. that you are proud of, and we will promote them, and we will respect the outcomes of those uh, uh, of uh, of those justice uh, justice systems. Mm. There's something you yes. mentioned, Justice Gogi, and this yes. was about the backlog. So this 24 percent that end up in court, 21 percent, 21 percent that yes. end up in court, yes, and we still complain about backlog. Yes. You participated in conversations about the active case management. Correct. So first of all, what's the cause of the backlog and what are you currently doing to address this, to make sure that once I get into the system, I call it the system. Yes. Once I'm arrested yes. and then your case has gone to prosecutor and I'm brought before a magistrate, yes. I am in the system. Yes. And the community has already judged me and everybody has, are these guys in court? Yes. How long should it take for me to get out of this system? And, and there's no and exit. Get my, yes. And get my justice. <laughs> yes. uh, very good question. Um, so, um, let me answer that question in two ways. So, first of all, uh, let me say, um, so first of all, I believe we need to reduce the 21% that's coming into court because that's already overwhelming the court system. So, um, a soldier report by the judiciary mm. the our backlog stands at uh, 617,000 cases roughly okay 617,000 that's the last soldier mm. okay and i said every year or uh, last year we, uh, we had 484,000 cases filed um so you can expect every year the cases will continue increasing not reducing the only dip we've seen was last year because of covid so mm. covid had some at least one positive externality mm. but um we expect in the future those cases will keep rising, not reducing. And and given the number of magistrates and and judges we have, it's a finite number. We have about six hundred. Mm. So if you divide four hundred and eighty-four to 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 six hundred, you get about eight hundred cases. Mm. They can't finish those eight hundred cases. So there is a need, first of all, to reduce. Mm. Uh, the conversation we're having about AJS is one way to reduce even the number of cases that are coming to courts because we can't keep doing the same things and then expecting different results. Mm. But secondly, of course, we also need an increase in the number of magistrates and judges. That's a conversation I know JSC is, is pursuing uh, with the executive. Um, that's definitely needed, especially mm. given uh, where we are going. But thirdly, uh, to uh, return to the point that you brought, is uh, we also must change how we do things as a judiciary. Mm. So this is a conversation we have been having for some time now, but we are now reaching the peak of that. And it, I, I see that uh, the Honorable Chief Justice Martha Kome has now made it one of her, her pillars uh, in, uh, uh, of, her, of her blueprint. Uh, we must change our work methods. Mm. 
that is what active case management is. Mm -hmm. We must train our judicial officers mm -hmm. uh, in how they manage the cases that come before them, how they move them forward, how they manage their dockets, and so forth. We must manage. We must um, uh, uh, change our systems of accountability. Uh, we've gone so far in Kenya. I think we. We really are leading um, uh, globally in terms of just accountability for, for judges and magistrates, in terms of our um, uh, uh, collecting our statistics, in terms of performance management, in terms of accountability that we have in place. Now the next step is to holding judicial officers accountable for their docket. Mm -hmm. So that once you've been given a case and we are four in a station, you don't just say, hey, if I'll nikubo, I'll muga nikubo sana. So, <laughs> what I will do is I'll just make sure it doesn't proceed today mm. so that uh, next week it will go before and do. <laughs> and then she can deal with the, with, with the mess. So, yeah. I look for every reason to, to adjourn. Mm. And, uh, and of course, there's, there will always be one lawyer who wants a case adjourn. Yeah. Right? So, uh, then I will uh, quickly acquiesce to the adjournment so that next week I make sure that it doesn't come back to me. It goes to do, then who has to deal with it and so forth. So now some of the changes we are making mm. and um, uh, in Nakuru, these are changes we've already, established, we've already established they have been in place for the last two years. Um, once a case comes in, it's randomly allocated to a judicial officer. Mm. It's yours. It's your baby. Ukwe mgonjwa? Uadijon? Uende wapi? Urudi? Unaikuta. Okay, file, file 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 what file if you're file. transferred? Yeah. Now, and, 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 until you transferred, but remember, there is now the system of performance evaluation. You are reporting mm. your numbers. <laughs> you are reporting your numbers. The Chief Justice is looking at your number. Mm. The Chief Justice has a place where she's saying, How many cases has Justice Google decided mm. this, uh -huh. this month? So, with those, with that pressure, and with all those cases coming to individuals, and you're individually responsible for them, I believe we are going to see a lot of changes. Sure. Yes. You know, there's a discussion about the other agencies within government yes. that are part and parcel of this system. Okay? Yes. So much as we talk about the judicial system and what they need to do, there are certain things that are beyond them. Yes. What conversations do you think you ought to have with the other agencies so that in reality, yes. from their end, that particular burden is also reduced? Absolutely. That's a very good question. Um, uh, that you've asked because um, uh, the justice system is as weak or as strong as the justice chain. And the justice chain, especially in criminal uh, justice, is very long. It starts, with the investigator, it starts with the police, the investigators, the prosecutors, the prisons, the lawyers, to, um, to, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the judicial officer. So there are very high level conversations. The conversations are taking place at two different places. At the highest level of uh, policy making, there is a National Council for the Administration of Justice chaired by the uh, Honorable Chief Justice. That is where a lot of the policy issues that has affect the different agencies take place. Mm. Um, and then at the local level, uh, we have the court users committees. Court users committees are replication a cascaded replication of the National Council for Administration of Justice, mm. both at the county level. So at the county level, as a presiding judge, I chair the county uh, CUC, which again brings the heads of agencies of the different uh, uh, stakeholders in the justice system. And then you go down lower uh, to the magistrate's courts level, there's also now the, uh, the magistrate's court uh, users committees, which again uh, uh, brings uh, uh, together uh, stakeholders at that, at that level. So those conversations are taking place um, at those two levels, and what emerges from the magistrate CUCs comes to the county CUCs, then we cascade them up to the National Council for Administration of Justice. So that when we are engaging constructively in that manner, then we can be able to systematically see where the bottlenecks are, and then policies can be, uh, 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 can be fashioned and crafted at the National Council for Administration of Justice, and then cascaded back down to the CUCs. Justice Ngoge, thank you very much for joining us today. Justice Professor Joel Ngoge is a judge of the High Court of Kenya. He is a presiding judge in the Nakuru High Court. And recently, during the review of the Judicial Performance Review, your station was voted the best, was found to be the best. <laughs> Congratulations, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Congratulations, you and your team at the Nakuru station. Good stuff that you're doing there. And thank you for joining us. Come again soon. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. We like having these conversations, <laughs> talking about Judiciary Thursdays. That's what uh, Chief Justice Martha Kome said. On Thursdays, Kenyans would like us to have a conversation about justice. Then we said, yeah, 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 that's a good thing, because we'd like to have a conversation about justice, <laughs> how we can access justice better, how we can make sure that cases are speedy, speeded up, how we can remove the backlog from the courts. And today's conversation was about alternative justice systems.
Justice Gogi sema kwaheri ambia wananchi wa Kenya kwaheri <laughs> <laughs> Asanteni kwaherini thank you for uh, for talking to me about justice we hope to see you in a place uh, near you to talk about alternative justice systems and changing the conversation about justice in Kenya Indeed we've been live on KTN home since 7am it's now coming up to 9 the conversation continues on Spice FM